Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Pinnacle of Prophecy. I want to welcome all of those here in Sacramento area to this very special Bible study series. I'd like to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. We've been looking forward for a number of months now for this special in-depth Bible prophecy seminar. Over the next few nights together, we're going to be looking at some of the most important, some of the most fascinating prophecies in the Bible, in particular, the book of Revelation. So we are glad that you are here. Now, there are some lessons that go along with each presentation. Those of you who are here in person, hopefully you already received it. Tonight is lesson number one entitled, The Truth About Angels. That's going to be the topic that we're going to be looking at this evening. For those of you who are joining us online or in the various television networks, you can just simply go to Panorama of Prophecy, actually Pinnacle of Prophecy, excuse me, PinnacleofProphecy.com, and you'll be able to download the lesson for free. Again, it's just PinnacleofProphecy.com. Download the lesson and you'll be able to follow along with us as we study through the Word of God. Well, as part of our program every evening, we're going to take time to answer your Bible questions. And we're just delighted that Pastor Doug Batchelor, president of Amazing Facts, is going to be leading us in our study together. Pastor Doug is, as mentioned, the president, speaker of Amazing Facts. He joined the ministry in 1994. And since then, after taking the reins of the ministry, the ministry has grown to become a real international presence in the proclamation, the preaching of the everlasting gospel. Pastor Doug's program, Amazing Facts with Doug Batchelor, is broadcast across the United States, also translated into various other languages and broadcast in other countries. And he has a regular radio program called Bible Answers Live, where he answers Bible questions that people will call in and ask. So he loves the Word. He loves teaching the Word. Pastor Doug is appreciated for his knowledge of Scripture and his ability to take some really complicated truths and present it in a way that makes sense, that you can understand. So we're just delighted that he'll be leading us in the series. And for the, Q, the question and answer portion, he'll be joined by Karen Batchelor. So I'd like to give, invite Karen and Doug to come out. Let's give them a warm welcome as they answer our Bible questions. Thank you, Pastor Ross. And I don't think Pastor Ross told you he is a vice president of Amazing Facts and does the Bible Answer program with me, but tonight I'm very thankful that Mrs. Batchelor is going to help me with the questions. Welcome, friends. Good evening, everyone. We're so glad you're here. I think you're going to believe and see that this is a life-changing experience. Amen. Because the things you're going to be talking about are the real priorities in life. And so uh, each night we're going to take some Bible questions. Now, the questions typically are going to come following the presentation that was prior. And I'm assuming it was mentioned there are 14 presentations. The series is on Revelation chapter 14, and it's a springboard for studying the whole Bible. And we're going to give you an opportunity to uh, ask Bible questions. And a matter of fact, there's a QR code. I'll let them put them up at the beginning of the question time. So our friends that are watching, if you take your phone and aim it there at that QR code, I've tried it, it works. <laughs> It'll direct you to a site where you can submit any Bible-related question. And we probably won't get all of them, but we're going to do our best to answer any Bible questions you have, especially in the times in which we're living. We need to know what the Word of God says. Amen? Amen. So we're glad you're here. Now, we've kind of primed the pump for the first night because you didn't have a chance to send in your questions. So we took some questions from prior seminars that were very popular, and we're going to use those to just kind of launch the question time. All right. Are you ready for number mm. one? All right. All right. Doesn't the Bible say the book of Revelation is sealed? How can anyone understand it? Yeah, it's a common misconception. I remember years ago, I was doing a seminar like this on the Navajo Reservation, and um, some people came in with great trepidation. I could tell they were really frightened. They came up to me afterward. They said, our pastor told us there's a curse pronounced on anyone who studies the book of Revelation. I said, no, it's actually there's a blessing pronounced on anyone who studies the book. Uh, the Bible says that it's not Revelation that's sealed. There's a prophecy in the book of Daniel that was sealed that's unsealed now. But the very first words in Revelation, you know what they are? Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The word revelation means a revealing. It's something he wants us to understand. And then God goes on to say, blessed are the ones who read, hear, and keep the things in this book. Cursed is the one 
who changes anything in the book. Mm -hmm. So it's a blessing to read it, but there's no curse pronounced on people who read and study it. All right. Are the 144,000 from Revelation chapter 7 the only ones that will be saved in the end? Yeah, some people get a little nervous because you read in Revelation chapter 7, by the way, the 144,000 is also in chapter 14 of Revelation. And they think, you know, all you do is get your calculator out and there are about a little over 8 billion people in the world today. And if only 144,000 are going to be saved, your chances are just a little better than the lottery. <laughs> so it's like 1 in 50,000. Some, someone's doing it right now on their calculator. <laughs> <laughs> but if you read on in Revelation chapter 7, it tells us that the 144,000 are not the only ones that are saved. See, the key is there in the 144,000 is 12,000 from the 12 tribes of Israel. Mm -hmm. And just like Jesus had 12 apostles that were leaders in, the, in his work, in his church, these are like last day leaders, and it says there is a great multitude that is saved that comes out of tribulation, comes out of great tribulation. So they're not the only ones. There's a great multitude converted and saved from their influence. Amen. How long will the great tribulation be? I've heard some people say seven years, and others have said three and a half years. I know I can hear you guys it, in the back. Hey, we're hearing a radio back here. Someone's <laughs> mic's turned up too much. It is a live program. You'll get to so know I, me better. You never know. What if I don't take care say. of that now, it's going to drive it's me crazy. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> I remember the question. Some say seven years. Some say three and a half. There's both uh, numbers in the Bible. There were three and a half years of famine in the days of Elijah. And there are three and a half years that begin the book of Esther. And then it talks about there were seven days of probation when Noah was on the ark, and, um, but the door was shut. Probation was closed. And then it talks about uh, in Daniel chapter 9, there are seven, it says uh, one week or seven years in prophecy. Some have taken that and applied it to the end of time. And, and so there's been a lot of confusion about that. Um, you'll also see in Revelation. Seven appears in Revelation probably more than any other book, hmm. and three and a half. But it doesn't always call it three and a half years. It calls it 1,260 days. Mm -hmm. Now, in a Jewish year, there are uh, 360 days to the year. So that's three and a half years. Mm -hmm. Or it calls it 42 months. That's three and a half years. Or it calls it a time a times and the dividing of a time. You'll also find that phrase used in Daniel. A time means one complete cycle of the seasons or one year. A times means a couple or a pair. Mm -hmm. So one plus a pair is three. And the dividing or half. So you've got three and a half several times in the Old Testament prophecies, three and a half. Some have wondered, is this great tribulation going to be seven years? Very unlikely because have you read the seven last plagues? Uh, humanity could not survive that. Yeah. The plagues that fell on Egypt, how long did they take? A matter of months, probably, maybe even weeks. So we got more on that. I don't want to say too much. All right. Keep coming. Could the six days of creation be symbolic, representing six long periods of time? Yeah, a lot of people have said, you know, with all of the information on evolution that we're con constantly bombarded with in our culture, and then they read in the Bible six days, they think, well, maybe those are six epochs of time, and that's really six million years or something like that. But if you read the Bible the way it's stated, these are six regular 24-hour days. It uses the, it says the morning and the evening. Now, one of the problems, the reason it can't be epics of thousands of years, who knows, what day of the week does God make the vegetation? Three. Third day, correct. <laughs> and when does God make the sun, moon, and stars? The fourth. But you're giving them the answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was excited. I knew the answer. <laughs> <laughs> so if God makes vegetation, does vegetation typically need the sun? God makes the vegetation on the third day and a thousand years go by before he makes the sun, would that work? No. no. So these are, these are not epics of time. 
They are, everything you read in the Bible, it's six literal days. It's repeated in the Old and the New Testament, and I believe what Jesus says. All right. Do you think that the current war in the Middle East is the beginning of what is called the Battle of Armageddon? Whew. Well, there's a lot I could say about what's happening right now, and as we sit here, it's continuing to unfold. Mm -hmm. Now, for our friends watching this, I know these programs are going to be broadcast for years, at the time of recording, the war with Israel and Gaza is still unfolding. As of this morning, I understand that uh, ground troops are actually rolling into Gaza and America has moved destroyers to the Persian Gulf and the Mediterranean, and there's a war in Ukraine, and uh, you've got the powers of North Korea and Russia and Iran that are communicating, and then of course, and China, and then you've got the, the uh, Western countries and NATO, and it is looking a lot like what happened before World War I and World War II with the different Axis powers, and it, it's frightening. Is that the Bible battle of Armageddon? No. Um, in fact, I'm talking about that here in this facility tomorrow morning. It's called Israel and the Battle of Armageddon. I didn't put that question in there to plug the message tomorrow morning. It just happens to be the case. But um, could this unfold or unravel into, uh, you know, a, a multi-nation conflict or what we would call World War III? Yeah, of course it could. Human nature has not, doesn't have a good record when it comes to war. Mm -hmm. So um, until the world is transformed by the Spirit of God, the, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And he meant from his day to the end. Yes. Whether this will unfold into an international conflict again, uh, I'm not a prophet, but I think we should be praying. Yes, for sure. Does God still perform first-class miracles today? We don't seem to see too many like the ones we read about in, ex in Exodus. Well, yes, God does perform miracles. Now, you, you may not see... You know, and what God did for the children of Israel, uh, even Moses and Joshua, they said, no nation has ever seen signs and wonders like this. That certainly was unique. Even when it happened, they knew it was unique. And so, uh, but will we see plagues again in the end? And those plagues that it talks about in Revelation chapter uh, 15 and 16 are very real. And so, but what about miracles? You know, I think it's interesting. Um, if you read the story of Gideon in the book of Judges, an angel appears to Gideon, and he says, man of God, the Lord is with you. And Gideon says, if the Lord is with us, then why are we having all these problems? And notice this. And Gideon said, whatever happened to all the miracles that we used to hear about? We don't see miracles anymore. Well, that kind of makes me laugh because after Gideon, first of all, God did some great miracles through Gideon. And then after Gideon, you've got people like Elijah that pray and fire comes down from heaven and he prays and it pours. And then Elisha makes an axe head float and they part the Jordan River and all these other incredible first class miracles happen after Gideon. Right. And then they slow down again. And there's different, then Jesus comes and you see another wave. And so these supernatural miracles and the power of God's moving, it does still happen. How many of you, maybe we'll get an audience shot so you can get the reaction. I saw that camera spin around, right? How many of you would say that you have experienced what you would define as a miracle in your life? Let me just see. All right, there's your answer. <laughs> In fact, I was just talking to one of our church members yesterday who was in a really horrific car accident and um, should have died. And I said, you know, you are a miracle. And she said, yes, and my doctors even say I'm a miracle too. So uh, yes, there are miracles that happen yeah. all the time. So many times we just don't see them as miracles because we expect to get in our car and drive from one place to the, to the next without an accident. But it's always a miracle, isn't it? Yeah. You're driving a 2,000-pound vehicle and all these other ones are coming at you. It's always a miracle. I think we, we just don't realize all the Amen. many ways in which God works in our lives. And these daily miracles, um, we just take for granted. And it's yeah. really the Lord keeping us safe. We call them a coincidence. 
Yeah. But God's performing miracles. And you know, did you know that one out of ten people on the highway on Saturday night is legally drunk? Doesn't that comfort you? The, the fact that you get around is a miracle. Amen. Yeah. yeah, that's for sure. I shouldn't have said that. You're probably real nervous now. Yeah, no, no one's going out Saturday <laughs> night. We do have a meeting tomorrow night. Please come. <laughs> <laughs> We'll let you go at 8.30, so it'll be okay. All right. Does Bible prophecy address the issues of climate change and global warming? Yes. Can you expound? Yes. Uh, one of the seven last plagues, men are scorched with great heat. That would be global warming. And if you read in 2 Peter chapter 3, and you could start with verse 10 where it says, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth and the things in it will be burned up. That would be called climate change and global warming. But uh, you do see there is a passage in uh, Revelation where I believe it's in chapter 11 and it says, God will destroy them that destroy the earth. So keep coming. You're going to, I think, be very excited about some of the things you'll learn. Well, there was change, too, with the flood as far as the atmosphere was, yeah. and things like that. Climate change back then, too. Yeah, yeah. Before the flood, the Bible says it didn't rain, but a mist rose up out of the earth and watered the earth, uh, the earth and the garden. And so, yeah, even then, things changed. Yeah, and sin brings about a lot of change, too, doesn't it? Yep. Is it okay for Christians to donate their organs? Yeah, that's not a prophetic question. But I'm just let's hope it's not a prophetic question. <laughs> but um, we do get that question a lot. And then we also get the question about is it, you know, are Christians required to bury or cremate? Is uh, yeah, the Bible saying anything about okay. that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um, you know, when you die, first of all, in the resurrection, you're getting a new body. Mm -hmm. um, I'm looking forward to trading this one in on a newer model. And so, you know, I've got a little tag or notice on my driver's license that if something should happen, you know, they're free to any spare parts they want. Woe be to the person who gets them. But <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I don't see a moral dilemma with that. I think actually, you know, one of the last acts of your life is hey, Jesus gave us his blood, mm -hmm. um, is to give life then by all means. All right. What is the third heaven that is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 2? Yeah, Paul, and it's only mentioned one time. Paul says, I knew a man about 14 years ago who was caught up to the third heaven. And people read that and they think, third, well, where you've got a third, you've got what else? A first and a second. At least a first and a second. And then some people, how many of you have heard someone say, I was in seventh heaven? I've never heard anyone say I was in the fifth heaven <laughs> or the fourth or the sixth. But, um, and, and then there are some churches that teach, and I'd respectfully disagree, that God has got like different levels of heaven. You know, you get different neighborhoods, and if uh, you behave well, you can get in Broadway or, you know, Boardwalk if you play Monopoly and Park Place or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, when Paul says uh, a man was caught up to the third heaven, in the Hebrew teaching, they understood there are three heavens. Now listen. The first heaven is the air around the planet. Mm -hmm. When you read in Genesis and it says, at the beginning God separated the waters below the heaven from the waters above the heaven, put the word atmosphere in there. You got waters above the atmosphere, waters below the atmosphere. It just means atmosphere, first heaven. Second heaven, it talks about, and by the way, that's where the birds fly and even the clouds float. Second heaven would be what we call the starry heavens. You know, the, the galaxies and, and the solar system, the heavens, heavenly bodies. The third heaven is called the dwelling place of God or it's sometimes referred to as paradise. So when Paul says, I saw a man who was caught up to the third heaven, he means up to the presence of God, to paradise, to heaven. So that's it. There's not, God doesn't have a segregated heaven. They had three understandings for the way the word heaven was used. All right. I think our time is up unless you want to go a little longer. Well, do we have one more? We have a couple more. Okay. Let, let's do one more. All right. I like this one. Is there any sin that cannot be forgiven? 
Well, you know, Jesus said, and he, he mentions this in two or three of his Gospels, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto the children of men. But blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost, shall not be forgiven. And in one gospel he says, in this life or in the world to come. And so there is one thing that God specifies, and, and it's interesting, you know, you, people blasphemed Jesus and they were forgiven. Paul says, I was a blasphemer and he was chosen by God. Um, but it says blasphemy against the Holy Spirit cannot be forgiven. Now, that always makes a person shudder. Pastor Jean and I do a, a radio program Sunday night and we frequently have people call in very agitated and they think, I, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. And we try to reassure them that they probably wouldn't be calling us if they were convicted about that. That's right. Because people who've committed the unpardonable sin and grieved away the Holy Spirit have like no conviction. And... Um, so the sin that cannot be forgiven is the sin that you will not repent of. Mm -hmm. If we become so comfortable in sin that we get a callous on our heart and we have no conviction about sin and we've just turned the volume down and we've grieved away the Holy Spirit. The Bible says do not grieve away the Holy Spirit. We've grieved away the Holy Spirit by refusing to listen to the voice of God. You could be in danger of just turning off the alarm one time too many and it never comes back on again. There are people in the Bible that did grieve away the Holy Spirit. Judas, Jesus said, what you do, do quickly. He went out and it was night. It says Satan entered him. King Saul went to a witch. Then he committed suicide the next day. By the way, Judas also committed suicide. They, they grieved away the Spirit. And uh, so it does happen, but you keep your mind and heart open to God. Keep talking to God, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Do you want to know more? I want to welcome you to the Pinnacle of Prophecy series. This is a brand new series using brand new lessons. I want to welcome those who are watching online. We know we have friends around the world. Some good news I, I heard today is this program, AFTV, is now airing across the continent of Africa beginning today. And so we're very excited to hear about that. I want to welcome our friends watching on 3ABN and the Good News Network and the other networks, Hope Channel International, that are participating in this international Bible study. Now, let me tell you what the genesis of this is. In the middle of the book of Revelation, which of course contains a lot of last day prophecy information, there's a chapter. It is sort of like the high point. And in that chapter, chapter 14 of Revelation, it has an overview of some of the most important events for the last days. It talks about who's going to be saved, who's going to be lost. It's got the coming of Jesus. talks about those sealed by God, those sealed by the devil. It basically is the, the center of focus, and we are using that as a springboard to be studying not only the prophecies of Revelation, but many of the other prophecies in the Bible and a lot of foundational truths and I think you're going to be amazed as you participate. Now, I'll tell you up front, if you didn't know, this is a 14-part presentation. I hope that you can make it a priority and come as often as possible or view them as often as possible. When you think about everything going on in the world today and you say, we're going to study what the purpose of life is and study how to be ready for eternity, please tell me what would be more important than that. And that's what we're going to be studying during this seminar is how you could know what is the truth? How do I know the Lord? How can I be ready for what is coming upon the world and have peace even in this time of great anxiety and insecurity? And so I thought it'd be appropriate. I won't do this every night, but you may have your Bible on a device. Some of you may have brought a Bible. Uh, this church may even have some in the back of the seats. I'm going to go to the last book in the Bible, Revelation and I'm going to read that one chapter, chapter 14. It's going to be the center of our study during this series. And uh, we're going to be talking about everything from the second coming of Jesus. It's going to be Sunday night. We're going to be talking about what is the beast of Revelation, uh, the mark of the beast, and just uh, a lot of uh, Armageddon, angels, subject for tonight, answering the big questions of life. The things we're going to be sharing 
are the things that changed my life. I was raised an atheist. And when I discovered these truths, it just totally changed my life and gave me peace and purpose. And, and um, I trust it will for you as well. Revelation chapter 14, I'm just going to read 20 verses. Reading on TV is always sometimes a risk. But I want you to stay with me because all of this is going to come out and just explode with meaning during the seminar. I looked and behold, a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps, and they sang as it was a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures. And the elders, and no one could learn that song except the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. These are the ones who are not defiled with women, for they're virgins. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits to God into the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives his mark in his forehead or on his hand, he also himself will drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out in full strength into the cup of his indignation. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worships the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap. For the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Then another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven, and he, having a sharp sickle, and another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in your sharp sickle, gather the cluster of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine from the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trampled out outside the city and the blood came out of the winepress up to the horse's bridle for 1,600 furlongs. I know that's a pretty sober thought to end on. That's chapter 14. Chapter 14 of Revelation basically coalesces the whole theme of Revelation. It's kind of concentrated and melted down in that chapter. And we're going to be studying those themes. Now, the first thing we're studying tonight, and I, I'm trusting you've got the lesson in your hands. I'll be going through the lesson. I'll be saying a lot of things that aren't in the lesson. So don't think, I'll just download the lesson and stay home because you'll be missing out. But uh, you can fill in the answers while I'm teaching because I'll be going through the different questions but this subject really needs to be the first subject. It explains the big question, why is there evil in the world? If God is good, if God is loving, if God is all-powerful, then why do so many bad things happen? Why is there war in the Middle East, in Ukraine, other parts of the world? Why do innocent people suffer? If God is good, why did God make a devil? 
people wonder. Angels appear probably more in the book of Revelation than any other book. I think you find 77 times in the book of Revelation it talks about angels. You can find angels about 285 times in the Bible. And now that's, you got the word angel, plus you got the word cherubim, and then you got seraphim, that means the burning ones. That's about two more times. And um, just in chapter 14 of Revelation, there are eight references to angels. The message of Revelation is distributed through angels. And so if we're going to understand something about this book, we probably ought to start with these supernatural beings called angels. So I'd like to ask a question. How many of you would say that you think at some point in your life you have experienced an angel or had some angelic intervention? At least you suspect it, maybe. You know, they did a study, and according to a poll in North America, 81% of Americans believe in the existence of angels. 51% believe they have personally been helped by one. I remember hearing one story in particular that's like many others. This girl, Deborah, in 1980, she was driving with her two children one night. She had a car that was not very dependable going between her parents, and she lived in San Bernardino. They lived in Alta Loma, 30 miles apart, a lot of wilderness between, and she had a gas gauge in her car that didn't work. She had to guess when she thought she was low on gas. Sometimes she misguessed. And this one night, going home with two a very small children in the car between the two locations, the car began to cough and sputter going up a hill and died. She's out there in two-lane road out in the middle of the des desert, some moonlit night. She thought, now what do I do? Leave the kids in the car? I can't do that. Try and carry two kids to find gas miles away? Can't do that. She put her head on the steering wheel and prayed and said, oh, Lord, help me. She heard a tap on her windshield jumped, looked up, and there's a young man standing there, and he signals for her to roll down. Well, you might be a little scared to do that late at night, but she didn't feel afraid. She looked like a clean-cut young man, and she rolled down the window. He said, put it in neutral. I'll push you up to the hill, and you can coast down to the truck stop, and there's gas there. It's about two miles, but it's downhill all the way. So she put her car in neutral and thought, how's he going to push it? This heavy old car. Began to push the car up, once it began to crest the hill and started to roll, she turned around to say, thank you, I'm good. He was gone. And there's desert out there, and it was moonlit. There was nowhere for them to hide. She swears it was an angel. Grew up telling her kids, you better believe in angels, they're real. <laughs> and I think, I believe in angels. Now, some of you might think, well, Pastor Doug, that sounds a little bit goofy, but uh, I believe what the Bible says, don't you, friends? And I want to promise you through this whole seminar Everything we give you is going to be from the Scriptures. I believe not only um, that the Bible is true, I believe during this seminar it is going to convince you as we study prophecy in the dependability of the Word. So with that, let's get into the first question in your lesson that you have in your hands. Question number one, what are the good angels like? Well, you find the answer in the book of Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6. It says, when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all of the angels of God, and then you fill in the answer there, worship him. You'll notice on the screen the answers are in like a, a teal blue. Is that what that color is? Worship him. Now, some people think that um, it's kind of superstitious and elementary to believe in angels. Do You know, if you asked people 100 years ago to believe that voice could be transmitted through the air, They'd say, that's witchcraft, it doesn't happen. Right now, you and I know, yeah, it's scientific, it actually does happen. Even though we cannot see x-rays and cosmic rays and ultraviolet rays and radio and television waves going through the air, you and I accept it as fact, and you don't have to be superstitious. Because we don't understand the realm that angels live in does not mean they don't exist. There's a lot of things we don't understand. But the Bible says they're very real, and I just told you, 81% of people in North America believe in angels. Funny thing is, some of those same people say they're atheists. Isn't that interesting? Who knows what the first words were ever spoken on a radio? 
First radio broadcast was 1906. They were testing out voice on radio using basically Morse code uh, receivers. And they discovered how to transmit voice. They transmitted a Christmas program to a ship. First words were the words of the angels that said that Jesus had come. Glory to God in the highest. Isn't that interesting? You know, the first words ever transmitted electronically was by Morse code. And he was quoting the Bible. He says, what has God wrought? That was in 1844. You also look in uh, Revelation chapter 7, verse 11, about the angels. And all the angels stood around the throne. And the elders and the four living creatures, they fell on their faces before the throne and they worshiped God. And when we get to the answer, you can say it out loud with me. That's okay. And so the angels worship the Lord. Uh, they, and these, of course, are the good angels. Now, I'll give you a few angel facts very quickly. The Bible tells us that angels have real bodies. They are not just, they're not ghosts. Uh, they have appeared all through the Bible, and sometimes they've sat down. They do things that are tangible. The um, Bible talks about guardian angels. There are angels that record. We're going to get to some of this in a minute. They are messengers. They are ministering spirits of God, and they are very fast. Daniel chapter 9, Daniel starts to pray in the beginning of the chapter. By the end of the chapter, Gabriel comes to him, and Gabriel says, At the beginning of your prayer, I was sent. Now, if God lives off in the cosmos somewhere, let's just assume through the constellation Orion, for example. But even if you go from the closest star, that'd be four light years, Alpha Centauri or Alpha Proximi, traveling 186,000 miles a second, angels do not travel the speed of light or the speed of sound. They travel the speed of thought. You know, lightning goes 270,000 miles an hour. Angels go faster than that. They don't need a radar detector. They're never going to get caught. Very fast. Very powerful. They're real. What do the good angels do on earth? And it says, and you read in Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord, what's the answer? Encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. You remember it says in Psalm 91, he will give his angels charge over thee to keep you in all your ways. And the devil protested to the Lord that Job was surrounded by a hedge of protection. There are angels protecting him. He said, it's not fair. You can read in Psalm 103, verse uh, 20, Bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength. Angels are very strong. Another fact about angels. They also give us understanding. You read in Daniel 9, verse 22, And he informed me and talked with me, and he said, O Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand the angels often shared knowledge and understanding with the prophets sometimes God spoke through dreams and visions often through angels Hebrews 1 14 are they not ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation they are the army of God they're the hospital staff that's always doing God's bidding going to and fro the earth working to save people now this is where the study gets interesting um, because something happened that it, once you understand what I'm about to explain a lot of things are going to click for you a lot of people who say why 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 listen very carefully which angel turned against God and why you read in Isaiah 14 verse 12 to 14 it describes the fall of Lucifer I've got this here in my Bible if you have your Bibles you'll want to look in Isaiah 14, you can also be looking in Ezekiel 28, you'll find a similar passage. Here the prophet Isaiah, start with verse 12. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. That means the throne of God, the highest places. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you will be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. He had an optometry problem. He said, I, 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 I. 
Satan, something went wrong. He didn't start out Satan. He started out Lucifer. He was a beautiful angel. It began with him. You can read it says there in Ezekiel 28, 17, Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Now, all of God's creatures are created. The only non-created beings are God the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. All other intelligent life is created. The highest of God's creation was the leader of all his angels, top general, super talented, super brilliant, super good looking, super musical. His name was Lucifer. And if you knew him back then, you would have loved him. Some still like him the way he is today. But God did not make a devil. It says you corrupted your wisdom because of your splendor. Something happened in his heart and he became selfish. This is the big question. Number four, did God create Lucifer to be a devil? You know what the answer is? No. What does it say in Ezekiel 28, 15? You were, what's the word? You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. He's a created being. Until iniquity was found in you. People want to know where the first cold virus come from. Where did the, who had the first case of AIDS? Where they, there's certain mysteries. And people say, well, if God made him and he went bad and God knows everything, then God knew he was going to go bad, right? God makes his creatures free. God, you, God wants us to love him. And in order for us to love God, we need to be free. You cannot force love. That means God wants us to love him because of who he is. And if God pre-programs everybody to love him, is that love? It must be freely given. Now, how many of you are married? How many of you freely chose to get married? Hopefully, same hands. How many of you realize that when you chose to get married, there might be days of disagreement? And you still chose. How many of you were oblivious? I see a couple of hands. Well, I, I wanted to have a problem-free wife. So somebody sent me the solution to all of my problems. Not, not that you're a problem here, but you know, we have our moments. It's called Mrs. Wonderful. It's, it's a, a wife that will always agree with you. And she's pre-programmed. Don't worry about taking the trash out. I can use the exercise. What every husband always wants to hear. It really doesn't matter if you leave the toilet seat up. It makes it easier to clean. I didn't know that was next. You don't need a glass. Just go ahead and drink right out of the carton. A new reversible drill. Oh, honey, it is just what I needed. <laughs> Could I ever fall in love with her? No, it doesn't love me. It's pre-programmed. Could God have made creatures that say, I love you, God, I love you, God, I'll tell you whatever you want, I worship you, you're wonderful, you're great? Sure, would that be love? You know what forced love is called? Rape. God makes his creatures free, and he made all of them free. Lucifer, because of his power and his brilliance and his wisdom and his beauty, and the adoration of the other angels. It began to go to his head and he resented that he did not have all the power of God. He resented he could not procreate like humans. He resented that uh, he couldn't do the same kind of creation that God does and started thinking, I should have the power of God. I should be worshiped like God. And it began to eat at him and it probably happened over a long period of time. But he nurtured this discontent and then he began to sow seeds of discord among the other powerful angels in the universe. Now the Bible tells you what happened. Now, if I were to ask you to picture the devil, what do you see? First of all, what color is he? Usually red, right? And um, does he have a goatee? 
You know, I used to have a goatee and someone said I looked like the devil, so I shaved it off. I said, you look like a sinister minister. I thought that won't be good. Uh, and he's got a pitchfork in his hands and bat wings and red leotards and horns. Where in the Bible does it say the devil looks like this? But the devil is thrilled to have people think that that's how he looks. It's not how he looks. The Bible says he's beautiful. He was an angel of light. He is a very smooth operator. And he just assumed that people think that he's this kind of impish, diabolical looking, ghoulish character. You can see lots of them around Halloween. People dress up like it. No. Don't be fooled. The devil's very real. And uh, he is the leader of the rebellion against God. Question number five. How many angels were convinced by Lucifer's deception? Was he alone? No, he began to campaign. You see, the angels have tremendous power. They're stronger than humans. And the devil, Lucifer, as the chief angel, tremendous power. And somehow they believed that if they could just campaign against God, he would give the angels more freedom and more power. And, and Lucifer began to sow discontent among the other angels. And he's so smooth and he is so clever and he's, he's just a real manipulator. He was able to persuade how many? His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Now that's a third of who knows billions of angels. The Bible talks about angels and it uses the highest number you can use in Greek. It says 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. The Bible talks about an innumerable company. And so, if everybody's got a guardian angel and there's 8 billion people in the world, and we're probably not the only thing that angels do is guard people, and there might also recording angels, there's billions of angels, but this rebellion was massive. Some of you are thinking, well, why did God let it go on so long? Well, Let's look at this next thing. It says, His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. All right, I already shared that one with you. A little amazing fact I like to sprinkle. You know what a black hole is. A uh, black hole is basically, it's when a star implodes and dies. And because the matter becomes so dense, the gravitational pull is so powerful that even light that travels 186,000 miles a second cannot escape. It does not have enough escape velocity to get out of a black hole. It sucks everything in. When God originally made us, He made us to love. God is love. He made His creatures to love. When Satan imploded like a star that dies, his compass needle broke and it just turned in. It all was about himself, wanting the worship. What did he say to Jesus? Worship me and I'll give you the world. You don't have to die. He wants the worship. He wants God's position. That's why he had Jesus crucified. Thought he could take the throne by force. And he is like a black hole that just sucks the life out of the universe. He rebelled. What happened as a result of Lucifer's deceptions in heaven? Now it's kind of shocking. You think everybody wants to go to heaven. You don't usually put the words war and heaven together. But the Bible says there was what? War in heaven. It says war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon. Now who's the dragon? Satan. Clearly that'll come out later. And the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail because the dragon's got one third and Jesus and God have got two thirds. Not only were they outnumbered, but you got light against darkness, good against evil, they won. And they basically were evicted from heaven. You might be thinking, why didn't God just annihilate all of them? Can't he do that? I mean, he's God. Is there any limit to his power? Couldn't God just blink his eyes and vaporize all of the evil angels and Lucifer? He could have done it as soon as Lucifer rebelled. But just think about that. Lucifer has been hurling all kinds of terrible aspersions and claims and slander against the name of God. He's brutal. He's a legalist. He's, he's cruel. He forces us to be a certain way. He doesn't give us more freedom. doesn't let us have his powers. I mean, who knows what he said, but it wasn't good. And God said, okay, enough of you, and he's gone. 
The other angels would go, oh, don't rub God the wrong way. Look what he did to Lucifer. Maybe Lucifer was right. Maybe God is mean and arbitrary. God could not do that and secure loyalty throughout eternity in the universe. He wants his creatures to love and trust him. What's one of the central messages in the Bible? Have faith in God. If he forced us to obey, we'd never love and trust him. So he gives us freedom. Not only us, but he gave the angels freedom. So he had to allow Lucifer and his fallen angels to carry out their program and say, all right, if anyone in the universe wants to buy into what Lucifer's saying, they all had an opportunity to listen to his claims. Most of the universe rejected it, except one planet that was new. And the devil came down and he took possession of a serpent. And now I'm getting ahead of myself. War broke out in heaven. And it goes on to say, he, Lucifer, was cast to the earth. And who was cast out with him? His angels were cast out with him to the earth. Why did they come to the earth? Because he found an audience here. Now, you know, sometimes we'll say, I didn't want to do it. I think it was Flip Wilson, the comedian that made it popular. The devil made me do it. The devil, for one thing, is not om omnipresent. Most of the time, if we are tempted, it's the devil operating through fallen angels. We sometimes call them evil spirits. They're called demons. They're called, they'll tell me my microphone did not die. All right. Let's get a mic out here. It did. Go get me another battery in the meantime. So, okay. All right, that'll keep us going. That's what happens with rechargeable batteries. I don't ever trust them. <laughs> so there, you've got devils, you've got demons, you've got ghosts and goblins, and a lot of things that people apply to evil spirits. It's really talking about the, uh, Satan's fallen angels. Good man. Works. Here we go. Are we on yet? Test. One, two, three, four, five, six, a second. Six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Hey, bring that back. <laughs> Are we working? There we go. All right. There we go. Test. Get away from that one. Make sure you can hear me. All right. You can bring it up a little. Every time I, I. Are we on? Not on. Yeah. Yes, we are. Okay. I'm not at all flustered. Do you notice? Whenever I talk about the devil, this stuff happens. I just plan on it. I just, do you think he's happy? No, I just say, all right, what's it going to be? Before the program, lights all went out. Light board died. Just as I said, all right, we prayed, came back on. This is always something. He's, he's threatened by what you're learning. I can promise you that. So he wasn't cast to earth alone. His angels were cast out with him. And that's Jesus talked about evil spirits. I mean, if you believe Jesus, you have to believe that. So what methods does the devil use in his war against God? So we can understand his tactics. We need to know something about the enemy. What does the Bible say and what are his tactics that he uses? It says he, Jesus, was there in the wilderness for 40 days and what happened? He was tempted by Satan. He is called the tempter. He's constantly trying to entice people to do Things wrong. To sin. To break God's law. Why? The devil hates people. The devil hates Jesus. If you don't think so, just look at the cross. You can see what they did to Jesus was the devil unloading his anger and his fury against Jesus. He can't reach Jesus now, but he knows how much Jesus loves us. So the way he hurts God is by hurting us. And the devil has claimed this world as his dominion because our first parents chose to listen to the lies of the devil instead of trusting God and obeying God. And all the sin and the misery that we see in the world today and the war and the suffering, people say, if, why does God allow all this? God has no choice if he's going to be a loving God and make us free. This world rebelled. Satan set up his headquarters down here as a beachhead to battle against God. And our world, Paul says, it's like a theater to the universe of what's going on. 
He tempts. There in the Garden of Eden, he came and he uh, possessed the serpent. And he spoke through the serpent. God said, do not eat from the forbidden tree. And what kind of fruit did she eat? I heard someone say apple. I heard it. Where does it say it was an apple? They, they, and why do they call this? Because he ate it and Eve gave it to him stuck in his throat. But everyone says it's an apple. It said it was the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. It doesn't ever say it's... But I've never seen an artist or anyone portray it as a banana. <laughs> Eve ate the banana <laughs> or the, the pear or the pomegranate. It's always an apple. And I feel like apples get a bad rap. Apple is the old English word for any kind of fruit. And that's what happened. So he told her to eat the forbidden fruit. God said, you're free to eat from anything in the world, anything in the garden. There's just one tree you should not touch or eat from. And while she was doing her work in the garden, she looked over at the tree and the devil said, oh, she's looking. That's a start. And he took possession of the most subtle and hypnotic creature in the garden. The serpent probably had wings back then. A lot of cultures talk about flying reptiles. And the Bible says fiery flying serpent. Did you know that? And God cursed the serpent so it went on the ground. Probably flew. So it's up in the tree and he says, hi there. Oh, you're beautiful. Come here for a minute. And she came. She says, wow, I didn't know serpents could talk. Well, I couldn't until I ate this fruit. Look what it did for me. You know, God's trying to keep something from you. He said, you can't eat from the trees. Oh, no, he said, we can eat from all the trees, but not this tree. Oh, he knows you will be like God if you eat from this tree. That's what he wanted. He wanted God's position. And he was able to persuade her to reach up, take it, eat it. Then she gave it to Adam later. He ate it. Basically, the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, whoever you obey, you are the servants to the one who you obey. Adam was given dominion of this world when he surrendered dominion to the devil. The devil called all, all of his angels and they were cast down. They were restricted to this planet because they found an audience here. They claim it as their own. That's not me, friends. That's what Jesus said. Jesus calls the devil the prince of this world. Isn't that what he says? That's right. That's why the devil said, fall down, worship me, I'll give you the world. Because he claims it as his. Jesus came through his life to redeem the world, to buy it back by his life. The misery and the suffering and the war that you see going on, it's not God's will. Why do you think in the Lord's Prayer we say, thy will be done? If God's will was always done, why would we pray it? All the suffering is not God's will. If you want to know what God wants, look in Genesis. He made everything good, beautiful, good, good, very good. James says every good and perfect gift comes from God. Lucifer made himself a devil. And the other angels that followed him, they chose to rebel against God. Don't blame God. Blame the devil. It's, if it wasn't for God, we'd be in much worse shape. We've got so much to thank the Lord for because he's got angels that are guarding us to buy us. You've got one life to choose what master you want to follow. After Adam and Eve sinned, because their the robes, they were probably wearing robes of light. And then they discovered they were naked. The light went out when they sinned. That still happens today. And they went and they were ashamed. And God says, what have you done? Adam said, it's that woman you made. He blames God. And then Eve said, well, it's a snake that you made. And all of a sudden the snake can't talk and he doesn't have a leg to stand on. So this shame and blame comes from disobedience. The Bible says in John 8, 44, Jesus said he was a murderer from the beginning and he does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resource for he is a liar and the father of it. The devil is a liar and he's a deceiver and he's a murderer. Revelation 12, verse 10. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accuse them. What else does the devil do? He's pointing the finger and accusing. Who accuse them before God day and night has been cast down. 
You see that in the book of Job. The devil is accusing, Satan is accusing Job. He's always accusing. The devil will tell you to do something and then he'll turn you in for doing it. Now, in Revelation 14, it says God has three messages that go to the world before Jesus comes in the clouds. The devil has a counterfeit for every truth of God. He has a counterfeit three messages. You read in Revelation chapter 16, verse 13, And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. You've got the true messages flying in heaven. The angels of God are in heaven. You've got the beast, the false prophet, the dragon on the earth. Counterfeit messages. You're going to see this uh, truth and error juxtaposed all through Revelation 14. For they are the spirits of demons performing signs. So does the devil have power? Yeah. You read where Moses cast his serpent down before the Pharaoh, sorry, cast his rod down before the Pharaoh, it became a serpent. The Pharaoh then calls his magicians who work for the devil, sorcerers, they throw down their rods, they become serpents. But the rod of Moses, or the serpent of Moses, ate theirs. God's power is greater, but the devil's got some power to create illusions. So just because there's some religious movement and they say, we've got signs and wonders, that doesn't mean it's always from God. Amen? You can also read, it says, that great dragon was cast out the serpent of old called the devil and Satan. No question about who the dragon is. It says he's the devil. He's Satan who deceives the whole world. He is a deceiver. The danger with deception, it is the commingling of truth and error. You say, oh, well, yeah, I went to that meeting and there's a lot of truth, but they might put some poison in it. And so there's lots of religious groups in the world today and different religions and there's a lot of counterfeit out there. The devil's not afraid of having some truth. He just mixes in lies to deceive and makes it deadly. When is the devil, question eight, the most dangerous. When is Satan the most dangerous? It's when he goes to church. Even Jesus had a Judas. And when Judas went out, it says Satan entered him. And there are infiltrators. It says there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 14, Satan himself is transformed into what? An angel of light. So when the devil came to tempt Jesus in the wilderness, do you think he plopped down on the ground and he had his red leotards and his bat wings and his horns and his goatee and his pitchfork? I've never understood the pitchfork. But does the devil also bale hay? <laughs> and just, they, they got that from, I think, from Greek mythology, the trident of Neptune or something. But anyway... Is that how he appeared to Jesus? No, he came as a messenger from heaven, an angel of light. And then he mixed into seven and said, if you're the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Just prove it. The devil is very cunning. You know, uh, interesting, amazing facts. Probably the deadliest serial arsonist in North American history is a man named John Orr. He set about 2,000 fires between 1984 and 1991 in Southern California. He was based in Glendale, California. What's amazing is he was a fire chief and an arson inspector. He managed to solve his own arson cases, and they thought he was brilliant. And he trained hundreds of other firefighters. And he was the one setting the fires, and several people died in the fires that he set. He appeared like an angel of light. I'm come to solve the problem. He was the one starting the fires. So the devil is very insidious. And you don't have to worry so much about the devil when he knocks on your door during Halloween. It's when he shows up in church. And he claims to be, you know, the devil is going to impersonate Jesus in the end. You know the first thing Jesus said when he talks about the last days? Beware that you are not deceived, for there will be many false Christs and false prophets. Friends, come to this seminar. We're going to show you how not to be deceived. So you can know for yourself. Ask any question you want. We're going to make it as plain and open as possible. Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. The devil said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, What? 
the devil is quoting the Bible? Some people think that, you know, the devil comes along and all you got to do is hold up your Bible like when a vampire comes, you know, you hold up garlic or a cross and he's going to run. The devil will snatch the Bible out of your hand and he'll read it back to you. And then he'll misquote it. That's when he's especially dangerous. He says, it is written. So what animals in the Bible are used to symbolize Satan? These animals have characteristics that help us to recognize the enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober. The Bible says, be awake, be watchful. For your adversary, the devil, is walking about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he might devour. Lions, very powerful. And uh, now don't be confused, sometimes even Jesus is called the lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion is a, a symbol of power. But lions, when they're hunting, they use stealth. And the male lions actually do very little of the hunting. They go on the other side of the pack of impala or zebra. And they let out a roar, and the females are running. They're upwind. The zebra run to the females, and they do the hunting. They use deception, and the devil's like that. He's prowling, pacing, back and forth, looking for opportunity to bring us down. He's also compared to what? It says the great dragon was cast out that what's the other creature the serpent of old called the devil and satan in the very beginning because the devil used the medium of a serpent snakes in and of themselves are not bad i know some of us are really creeped out by snakes my mother was terrified she saw a snake on tv she'd faint i mean she just really didn't like snakes my brother and i'd like put a rubber one in her drawer and uh we'd be in trouble for a year <laughs> But um, he used that serpent. So through the Bible, you know, in the Bible it says you will tread on serpents. It doesn't mean we're going around stomping on snakes. It's talking about the devil, evil in the Bible. Number, question number 10. After his eviction from heaven, upon whom did the devil direct his fury? Where did he focus his attention? It says the dragon was enraged with the woman. This is God's church. Two women in Revelation. Got to study on that. Keep coming. And he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That phrase is also there in Revelation chapter 14, verse 12. Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Two characteristics of those who are saved in the last days. They have faith and they obey. They trust and they obey. The devil hates the people that trust and obey God. So you've got this dragon trying to attack the woman. It's like the age-old story of the, the dragon and the maiden in distress finally being rescued by the knight in shining armor who is Jesus. They drew all those fairy tales from this Bible imagery that you find. Zechariah 3.1, another characteristic of the devil is he's fighting the church. Then he showed me Joshua the high priest. He's the one who intercedes for all of God's people standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. The devil is constantly working to oppose and attack the people of God. You can also read in John 10.10, 10, the thief does not come except to steal, steal and to kill and destroy. Jesus said, I have come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. Now friends, tonight, those are the two choices. It's talking about Jesus saying, I want you to have life life abundantly the devil wants to kill to steal steal your life steal your eternity and destroy and we see that battle going on in our world today between these two titanic forces the devil has cast his vote against you jesus has cast his vote for you and you have the tie-breaking vote so how do people resist satan and his temptations you can read here in matthew chapter 4 10 Jesus said, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will you serve. So how do we fight him? Christ said that it's through the word of God. You see, the devil attacks us in our minds. And when you read the Bible, the promises of God, the truth of God affects your mind and your thinking and it gives you the power and the reasoning to be able to resist. And God gives you his spirit. Something happens as you draw close to God in reading His Word, you're going to notice a blessing come into your lives as you participate in this seminar, I promise you, because Jesus promised you. 
Blessed are those who read, hear, and keep the words of this prophecy. He wants to bless you. The devil wants to destroy you. So we read his word. What else did Jesus say? Watch and pray. Talk to the Lord. He talks to you through his word. You talk to him when you pray. You get to know him that way, and you'll love him. Lest you enter into temptation, the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. John, in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and what will God do? That's another reason I can promise you're going to be blessed by participating in this seminar. By the way, it's not too late. Tell your friends to tune in. Friends, I think when we scheduled this seminar, we did not ask them to start a war in the Middle East. This was scheduled a long time ago. I think that God is calling people right now, and the timing is perfect. And with everything going on in the world, friends, we don't know how much time we have left. You realize it's not going to last forever? Do you know Jesus said, speaking of the last days, that if he does not come, man would self-destruct. Except those days be shortened, no flesh would survive. Don't wait until that happens, friends. You've waited too long. So draw near to God. You're here. You're watching. You're listening. You are drawing near to God. He said he will draw near to you. He'll speak to you through his spirit. You watch and see if I'm not right. Then he tells us to take the helmet of salvation, uses the analogies of a battle, and the sword of the spirit, which is what? The word of God. Spend time in his word. It transforms us. Jesus, the Bible says, he is the word. As we study the Bible, we don't know what Jesus looked like. We know what he said. And as you study the Bible and you get to know him, it's going to transform you. It did me. Number 12. What is Satan's fate according to Bible prophecy? Does he get to live forever? It says in Isaiah 14, verse 15, Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. If anyone's going to suffer, the devil's going to suffer the most. Amen? You can also read in uh, Matthew chapter 25, verse 41, Then he'll say to those on his left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting what? Fire prepared for who? For the devil and his angels. Is that pretty clear that there's evil power in the world? Satan and his angels are fighting against God and his angels for your attention. And the Holy Spirit is working through God's angels. And sometimes the angels of God will be nudging you, saying, you need to pray. You need to read the Bible. You need to not do that and do this. And uh, there is a spiritual battle that's going on every day in our lives and we get to choose who we listen to. But there are tangible things we can do to draw closer to God. Furthermore, you can read in Ezekiel verse 28, 19, it says, You have become a horror, and you shall be no more forever. You know what that's saying, friends? When God makes a new heaven and a new earth, wherein dwells righteousness there are no evil angels, there are no devils, there is no Satan, there is no Lucifer. Can you say amen? There's going to be a world without sin. And you know, no one will ever doubt God's love again because this terrible experiment with sin that the devil launched is going to be understood. The Bible tells us in the book of Nahum, sin will not rise up a second time. I'm sorry, you and I were born on a battlefield. All you have to do is look around and say there's this strange contradiction in the world. You can see in creation the power of God and the, the relationships and the wonders of creation. You see there's miracles everywhere and just the way your bodies work and how a baby's born. There's miracles everywhere. But then we see evil. Something went wrong. We answered that question tonight. A very powerful, the most powerful being rebelled. He's fighting against God, and he wants your hearts. But you need to make the decision. How does God, question 13, how does God feel about the destruction of Satan and his angels and the wicked? God is sad. You know, he, he made them. He loved them. God is love. But he cannot abide sin, and his world made new. Ezekiel 33, he says, 
Say to them, as I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But the wicked turn from his way. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways. Why will you die? This is what the Lord is saying to you and me. He doesn't want us to die. He's calling for our hearts and our souls. He wants us to worship him. You know, Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, says that Jesus stands at the door and he knocks. He says, if you open the door, I will come in and abide with you. I think you hear him knocking on your heart tonight. He brought you to this meeting. He's arranged that you're watching or listening. He wants your heart. The devil wants to destroy you. Jesus wants to save you. All you have to do is open your heart and open the door and say, Lord, come in, help me. How many of you would like to say, I, I want the Lord's help to get through the last days, you at home? Can I pray with you? Father in heaven, we've learned some important things tonight. We pray that Jesus will come into our hearts, transform us, bless this seminar. We ask in his name, amen. Next program, tomorrow night, we look forward to seeing each of you there. God bless you, friends. Come back and bring your friends. Thank you very much.